Welcome to Free Associations from the Boston University School of Public Health, the Public Health and Medical Journal Club podcast for anyone who throws things at their television set when they hear the new medical research that contradicts what we've been previously told. I'm Matt Fox, Professor of Epidemiology and Global Health. I am here with Don Thea and Chris Gill from the Department of Global Health here at Boston University, and we are here, as always, in the Boston University Godly Studio. Before we get started, we want to take a second to remind you about the Population Health Exchange, Boston University's School of Public Health's resource hub for lifelong learning. Find out more at www.pophealth.com ex.org. That's www.pophealthex.org, where you'll find this podcast as well as many other population health learning programs and tools. And as a reminder, uh, we are available on iTunes and Apple Play and all your other podcast sites. We would really appreciate it if you would go ahead and really appreciate it. Give us a rating, uh, which will help other people find us if you're enjoying the podcast. Hopefully, a good rating. A nice rating would 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 go a long way. Now on to the. To the, to the show. You ready? So today in our first segment, our Journal Club segment, we are going to get into a study that looks at whether fecal microbiota transplantation for treatment of serious infection is better when delivered by oral capsule or colonoscopy. In the second part of the podcast, our deep dive segment, we'll talk about confidence intervals and precision in epidemiologic research. Can I just point out that you heard that right? Heard what right? The, the study we're doing. I heard it right. You heard or it no, right. No, no, the, the, the listener heard it right. Because at this point, the listeners are, are sort of going, ha, ha, because they're driving to work, and they're going, hmm, hmm, and they're like, what? Yeah, yeah. Fecal microbiota transplantation. We'll get into the details. And do, then, do you know uh, that this is Microbiome Awareness Month? I did not know that. It is. Thank you for alerting so us to that. Ex- that's December. I mean, obviously. I think it's very appropriate what's that the, we're doing what, this. What's the ribbon look like for that? <laughs> um, I'm not it's quite sure. Brown. I don't think I've seen it. Probably anyway. <laughs> All right. And then in our third segment, our amazing and amusing, we will get into some research that you probably haven't heard about. Or uh, Don will tell us what happens when researchers get really bored and come up with crazy ideas. So before we get into it, uh, actually, no, let's let's go right into it now that I think about it. Let's get into our first segment. So as Chris says, you heard it right. In this first segment, we are going to get into a paper that describes a randomized trial that looks at whether fecal microbiota transplantation and these guys can explain that to you. Whether it is better delivered through uh, oral capsule or through what? Colonoscopy. So a long a, tube, a long tube except- inserted from below, uh-huh. all the way up to the cecum, which uh-huh. is the juncture between the large colon and the small colon, in which the fecal matter is injected. Wow. Technically, there's only one colon. Wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, but we know and what you so meant. <laughs> the idea is to figure out whether or not this helps uh, with recurrent uh, C. diff infection, which I'm sure you guys can tell us a bit more about when we get to it. The study was published in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, and it is titled Effect of Oral Capsule versus Colonoscopy Delivered Fecal Microbi- Microbiota Transplantation on Recurrent Colostrum Difficile Infection, a Randomized Clinical Trial. The lead author was Dina Kao from uh, University of Alberta. Uh, people are referring to this as the poop pill study. Uh, it may just be me, but let's just say that people are saying it. And uh, let me give you some of the headlines here. Uh, Cure for superbug infections from fecal matter bacteria now in pill form, says the International Business Times. Fecal transplants, easy peasy, not so queasy, far oh, says Pharmacy News. Would you take feces pills if they saved your life? Nauseating capsules, which are 96% effective, could be the future of deadly C. difficile treatment as antibiotic resistance grows, says the Daily Mail. That is a long one. What? That was the title? Yeah. Yikes. Nova just simply says the poop cure. Uh, and then I will also point you to there was a there was Jam actually had a uh, uh, a commentary on this article which was entitled "Capsules for Fecal Fecal Microbiota Transplantation and Recurrent Colostrum Difficile Infection." Clostridium. Oh, I keep saying that wrong. Clostridium. Sorry, Clostridium Difficile. Angina. Oh. <laughs> Shall we start yeah. all over? Roll it back, Matt. Roll I, it back. I, I had a chat with my wife, and she disagrees with you on that one, too. Uh, the New Way Forward or a Tough Pill to Swallow. That's I, I, the JAMA. That is from JAMA. I like the title of There's a New Yorker article on this. It was called The Excrement Experiment. Oh, good. Boy. Wow. This There's, is just one of those where they, they've got to go for it. Yeah, yeah and I want, I want to say up front, before we get into the details here, that uh, there's obviously a lot that— 
that we could riff off here. Uh, I do want to point out this is a really serious infection. This is true. Uh, that that does uh, lead to death for for some people. Um, so we are not in any way poking fun at the people who suffer from this infection, but it is a really odd, outlandish concept. Cure. So anyway, so let's get started. Uh, Don, can you? Can you give us the breakdown of what they what they did in the study and and why they did it and whether or not you think it worked? Sure, but what I wanted to do is give a little bit of background oh. on C diff. Okay. Um, so, it's, uh, how, how do you say it again? C diff. No, no. Clostridium difficile. Clostridium. That's the organism that ordinarily lives in your colon and is in balance with the other microbi- micro micro um, organisms in your colon. And when you take antibiotics, you could disrupt that balance, and there's an overgrowth of this one particular organism, which can um, occasionally produce a toxin. It's the toxin that produces the diarrhea. And it afflicts about 500,000 um, people every year, and serious. about 14,000 people actually die of it. So, um, so this is, this is it's a very this is, serious illness. Yeah. And why, and, why not just treat it with antibiotics? And the typical antibiotic treatment is uh, to swallow an antibiotic that is not actually absorbed into the bloodstream, but is active within the colon itself. It's called vancomycin. Um, and it works fairly well, but um, it doesn't work all the time. And some, and a lot of times what happens is that this infection comes back. So you get yeah, recurrent C. diff colitis. And um, there, it's, not, it's not a completely outlandish idea because apparently... What, what is not a completely outlandish using idea? Using fecal matter in transplantation, because I... I uh, was unaware of this, but did a little bit of digging. And apparently the first fecal microbiome transplantation occurred in 4th century China. It was called yellow soup. Say what now? Uh, yeah, it was a fecal yeah. suspension and a remedy for severe diarrhea by Gay Hong, apparently, is the, is the uh, Chinese physician who, um, who uh, first discovered it. Um, and they, he thought it was a cure for malarial fevers at the time. Wait, wait, can you say specifically what this is? What, what are you talking about here? When you say so, it's transplanting mic- somebody else's feces into your gastrointestinal tract. Okay. So you are, you're in, in, in essence reintroducing um, somebody else's bacteria and colonizing your your um, GI tract with quote normal bacteria. And you say this this isn't the craziest idea. This sounds to me like the craziest idea. This sounds to me like rule number one of public health is we don't. Do this <laughs> right, right. Well, under cer- on, under most circumstances, there are many we reasons don't. not to. Yeah, but 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 Don's right. I mean, you, did you know also that the the Bedouins uh, do this currently? This is a, this is a a common therapy that the people with dysentery are treated with sort of a a tea made out of camel dung, um, which is I, you know, I don't know if there, I, I would doubt there are any randomized controlled trials, but this is this is a, a common therapy for for dysentery. Okay, interesting. Uh, in many parts of the world, and and as Don's saying, it's you know it it, it sounds bizarre, but actually it kind of makes sense because you know bacterial you know gastrointestinal diseases are 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 are, are basically a, a dysregulation of the the microbiota in various forms, and C diff is like sort of the perfect example of that. Sort of hanging out in the corner, waiting to overgrow. And once it overgrows, it then does bad things. Yeah. I mean, it, it was sort of ironic because on the news today, uh, they were talking about this, this uh, you know, the first large scale, scientifically rigorous probiotic study for that, children yeah. with um, various gastrointestinal uh, complaints. And, and um, you know, there they're trying to change the course, the, traje- the clinical trajectory of these various conditions by, by supplementing a single organism into the, into the, bico- into the intestinal ecosystem. Um, and, and yet what, what a stool transplant is, is essentially transplanting an entire microbiome. Okay. Which one would think in some ways, you know, if you're taking it from someone who doesn't have gastrointestinal uh, complaints, it makes great sense. Interesting. All it's right. Sort of, it's sort of fascinating. All right. So, so, in the, so, so in the what United, they do? So apparently in the United States in 1958, there was, uh, there was a surgeon, Ben Eisman, in Denver, who um, gave it to post-surgical patients because pre-surgical antibiotics are ordinarily given, and some of his patients would develop colitis afterwards. So okay. this is not the first first time that this has been questioned. In fact, in, in January of 2013, there was a New England Journal of Medicine article which did a randomized control trial of... Um, um, FMT, we're calling it, which is fecal microbiome transplantation FMT. versus vancomycin, which was the best alternative yep. therapy. And vanco was um, 
they had to stop the trial early because Vanco was um, effective only 30% of the time, and the fecal transplant was effective 96% of the time. So it just it was really, it really blew works. everybody away. Incredibly impressive. Really works. So then the question that we're discussing here today about this paper is, what's the best way to get it into you? Because in that New England Journal paper, <laughs> what they did was they did this, the colonoscopy, which is which is a, it has to be done in a hospital or surgical unit, and it's got cost, and it's got there there are um, complications, risks, yep. all sorts of risks. It's very difficult to do to somebody who already has pseudomembranous colitis right. in the giant intestine, right? Because the intestine the risk of perforation is, is huge. Yeah, yeah. So so in any event, that that was the question that they were asking. So the, so that they set this up as um, an unblinded non inferiority study of 116 inpatients and outpatients who had had at least three episodes of recurrent C. diff diarrhea. Um, and so they... Uh, they, what they, what they, what they Which did. means that they failed again and again and again with the standard therapy. Right. And, and I, I think it said in the, in the article, it had to all be within the prior three months. Yep. So, so recent failures of, um, of standard therapy, which is, which is vancomycin. So um, they gave them eight weeks of antibiotics ahead of time to both arms. Um, people had to be positive for C. diff. Um, toxin, which is the way you diagnose it, yep. um, and they okay. excluded people with certain conditions that they thought might be um, might be um, complications like in, um, inflammatory bowel disease, pregnancy, breastfeeding, um, and antibi- and any kind of an antibiotic requiring condition. Um, the donors for the fecal matter were seven healthy donors, from which they harvested forty capsules of stool for the oral arm. 40, 40 per person. For 40 per 40 person. 40 capsules of stool per person, right. Or a slurry of, I think, 300 milliliters. Slurry. <laughs> slurry of 300 disgusting. milliliters that was used for the colonoscopy arm. Um, so basically, they split it into um, two arms, and they looked at the proportion, and they gave the intervention, and they looked at the proportion of um, patients who remained free of recurrent symptoms <clears throat> at 12 weeks. Yep. And in essence, um, I think all but four were successful. And in fact, those four that had an episode of recurrent um, diarrhea at 12 weeks, when retreated with the initial um, course that they had, they had gotten, they in fact got better. So it was, it was a very successful trial in which the non-inferiority of the oral capsules was established in comparison to um, the, the colonic colonoscope delivery method. So pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty impressive. But I think also one of the interesting things is they looked at a couple of other endpoints, which were adverse events, but quality of life and what I call the ickiness factor. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> I thought that was, that was really pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. And in the icky, ickiness factor, apparently 30% in the beginning characterized the idea of fecal microbiome transplant as being unpleasant, gross, or disgusting. Wait, wait, wait. Oral or any? I think any is what I think Just it was. Kind I think of it was gross. the concept yeah, of yeah. taking on somebody else's stool. Yep. Um, and then afterwards, 79% of them said it wasn't as an icky is not the term that they use in actually writing the No, no, the, the terms were gross, unpleasant, disgusting. Right. So 79% at the end, after the procedure, said it was not as icky as, um, as believed. 97% would do it again. And I think it's really important to note that... that um, Presumably if they needed it. Right, right. right. Um, that it was, it was about a third the cost. Yeah, well, really, so which is really important. lots of advantages for taking these capsules. Right. Crap. Did you say crap shills? I did. You did, Don. Come on. You've been, you've been planning that all weekend. <laughs> what did, how, no, when, I just thought of that. did you think of that? Come no, on. I just thought of that. <laughs> I know. Is that, does that stay on the, the, the pod? Uh, <laughs> no, we'll that definitely that out. stays on the pod. Well, we'll, Come on. We'll, I don't think that's, I think that's okay. Uh, that's not going to give, right. us, that's not gonna give will, us an uh, explicit rating, is it? We will allow that. We'll allow that. Chris. Chris, to you. So, so, so us, wait a second, oh, Matt. That, Im- <laughs> that still implies going. to the listener that there's all sorts of stuff that has been edited out in the past. And I, I'd like to say that, in fact, nothing, almost nothing has been edited no, out. No, but I would like to point out. I would like to point out. I would like to point out that on the episode that they're listening to, we've edited out about a half an hour already. <laughs> Of things that Don in particular has said. Tr- that's no, not true. That is not true. That, that is absolutely not true. All right. So, Chris, give us give us your take on this study. Is this a, is this a good study? Episode 13. We had to edit that one out entirely. <laughs> that was, that was a bit of a... Oh, wait. This is episode 13. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. All right. Give us your... How lucky. Uh, 
Give us your take on this study, a good study, bad study. Are you convinced? And uh, would you take the treatment if you had to? Uh, yes, yes, and yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, the podcast is over. The podcast is over. <laughs> um, I mean, I, as I was saying up, up front, I mean, I think that the, the, the idea, uh, the theory, this, the, 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 the biological plausibility of this is really high. You buy this. Totally. Yeah, I absolutely buy this because the, the intestinal flora is essential. It's not like, the, you know, it, it's not like there's this mass of, of bacteria in there doing nothing. They exist in this sort of complex complicated symbiosis with the body. And in truth, we really do not yet understand what that symbiosis is about, but it is increasingly clear that this is a very important balance. Uh, and then, you and know, there's and, and a whole bunch of chronic diseases that we're now identifying as being associated with this dysbiosis. That's absolutely right. You know, and, I, and you know, I think if you go look at at, at um, you know other disease states, like there's these these fascinating studies done in in in, in mice, where there is are you know differences in the microbiome of mice that are are morbidly obese uh, from mice that are slender, yeah, 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 and that this. you can transplant the gut of the slender mouse to the obese mouse, and they will lose weight. And conversely, the obese mouse's intestinal microflora will cause the skinny mice to gain weight. So there, it, it, it totally makes sense to me. And it's, it's probably goes way beyond just the, 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 the balance of the bacteria, though that's very important because there are three factors in, in this. One is the, the genetic makeup of the host um, and how you know, it is able to interact with different bacteria based on its genetic um, uh, predisposition, shall we say. There's the immunologic responses between the, the host and the, the pathogens in the gut. And then there's the composition of the, the gut itself, the microflora. And all three of these are in this sort of complicated, you know, reciprocal, you know, one have to imagine sort of in, in sort of indecipherably complex set of relationships, but very important. But it's not just that, because when you transplant the, the microbiome of a donor, you're also transplanting all the contents of the, um, uh, I guess, the, the, the secretions of the donor into that came along. We're right. So it's like the, the intestine is filled with secretory is, antibodies. Okay. Okay, it's okay. absolutely filled with chakra block, filled with intestinal IgA molecules and IgG molecules that that are, you know, part of the fight that is going immune, on between immune, the immune system yep. and the and yep, the yep. and the bacteria, and all and also sort of many many innate factors that are secreted into the gut. And so when you when you transplant the, you know, the the, the slurry, as Don was saying, which is you know a, a, a cooking term, it's a current term we all learned. <laughs> is, basic it, is, this term, is this no a term that's analogies. actually used? No, <laughs> everybody will be for, slurry, aware. With yes, what, absolutely. It, this uh, is a term that's used slurry. for yeah, in right. the medical world. It's, yeah, yeah. it's when you take a, a sort of a a, 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 a a solid mass and you mix it with water into kind of a mush. Did you read the did which you doesn't read the, dissolve? Did you read the supplemental dissolve, right. material on how to make the slurry? Yeah, uh, I don't. But everybody yeah. will be familiar with it because this is a, it's a, the common, <laughs> most commonplace uh, slurry that people see every you know regularly is cake batter. Cake batter is slurry. <laughs> I'm never going to be able to eat cake batter cake again. Cake batter is a slurry. What it specifically says in the in the in the instructions, you put the poop <laughs> Where in a jello bag. Where it's not. You put the poop in a bag and then you mash and squish the bag with hands until liquid no, it, liquid is homogenous. And I could say you can Three use a spatula minutes. and add, add a cup of you know a, a dash of then vanilla. Then wash hands. And then you cake says, batter. Then yeah, wash it's the hands. same thing. Right. Well, Gross. you should you should also wash your hands after you make cake batter. Obviously. Um, so I I think it, I think it makes sense and um, I. I think it's really uh, interesting that the um, the delivery route did not matter. That this may be a volume issue, uh, because in the past when they've tried to do this, and they, there's been suggestion suggestions in less rigorously designed trials that the 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 colonoscope delivery method is superior to the oral method when delivering it through a nasogastric tube. But a nasogastric tube is very difficult to deliver high volumes compared with the colonoscope. Well, and so it may be that there's a dose-response relationship, which would also make sense. No, so they, the other, but here they, they balance that by having actual gram for gram the same amount of stool being transplanted. But they also pre-treated everybody with vancomycin, and they and they made sure that nobody took pro, pro, uh, proton pump inhibitors to... Which so could that, kill so the bacteria. That, so that, the, so that right. the stomach acid was decreased. So that, That's right. that gave them... a. You know, sort of a more of an equal playing field. So I, I think this this was a much more rigorous design, and, and like I said, I think the biological plausibility is is, is really high. Yep. Um, and I, I have to say, my God, you know, as a, as a clinical infectious disease doc back in the day, uh, Clostridium difficile infections were the absolute bane of my existence, and it made my patients miserable, and it killed quite a few of them. And and we were and aware it's getting worse over in time. the trenches, right? That that you know this this was a disease I remember as a resident that was common and vexing but curable. And by the time I'd become an ID fellow, it was yeah. Severe, catastrophic, and occasionally fatal. And I, I, 
And I, the, there are many moments where I was like, wow, C. diff really seems to be changing its nature. And then all this evidence came out that indeed the, the, you know, we were witnessing a slow moving outbreak of this hypertoxin secreting C. difficile clone that is spread across the world and was causing, was actually a much more severe disease than it had ever been before. Prompting, I have to say, kind of radical interventions like this. Yeah. So I don't know, I'm, double thumbs up. I, th- I believe it. Double I th- thumbs up. I think this that's is a, that's uh, yeah, a pretty that a big step forward. Study and, I, and, a, and I think a, a major, no major criticisms. advance. And no a much criticisms. more practical solution, quite frankly. Yeah. If, if you could do yeah. this by, by capsule form, you could you could legitimately establish, I mean, it sounds crazy, but stool banks where you pre-screen donors to make sure that they don't have the kinds of intestinal infections that, that you were worried about. You know, the, uh, yeah, well, this is a conversation we had all fair, but uh, uh, my concern cetera, is, but, uh, and, they, and they do actually mention this in the discussion, but uh, you know, there is always the risk of transplanting infection. Right, absolutely. Transplanting something that is... But they, they were they were rigorous about this. But of course, that yeah, I'm, no, I, mean, I mean, fecal oral infections are like the number I, one infection on the planet. I don't know how you define rigorous. I mean, I, they they certainly screened the donors uh, for whether or not they were currently experiencing any illnesses that would be indi- indicative of of pathogens. But uh, I don't know. I mean, is that the same as looking for p- pathogens? I don't know if you can do that. Well, yeah, obviously you can't rule right. it out because there's a lot of them. There's, there's a, <laughs> a whole lot of stuff going on in there. But this but, is uh, actually this has actually become can... an industry. There's, in fact, an organization oh. in my hometown, Medford, Massachusetts. Oh, boy. That is, uh, it's called How Open. How do you know about this, Open, Don? I, it's uh-huh. called Open Biome because I walk past their offices uh-huh. on a regular basis. Uh-huh. Walk and, past and, and or walk you, in? They they screen people to be donors, and if you get through the rigorous screening process, and it's, from what I understand, quite rigorous, only about 10% of people actually um, get past the process, you become a donor, they will give you $40 per, per, per sample. Per sample. Per sample, that you that, and they have chronic long-term um, um, donors, and they have, in fact, donors that are so good that they've, uh, they've <laughs> provided them. <laughs> How do you find so good? No, no, they've 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 provided them specific, um, really good names. Like there's one who's named Vladimir Putin. <laughs> Another one, Winnie the Pooh. Uh huh. Yep. These are the code names. Code names for the for the really good donors. Dump, These are like awards. Dumbledore. <laughs> oh come on. <laughs> And the, uh, my, my, my favorite is Albert Einstein. No, no, stop it. Stop it. Uh, this is an MIT spinoff, right? These are the, the yeah. brilliant minds of the world. Okay. Right. No, right. There's, there, I, they're I doing found, very well. They're selling found, it. They sell it only, uh, almost at cost, $250 a, a sample. I, and they're sending stool all over the world, apparently. I found out there's a website called The Power of Poop <laughs> in which they provide you with instructions for how you should go about freezing your own poop in case you need yeah, it at a later yeah. date. Uh the website did not look particularly reputable to me, such that I would say you should go and follow this, but I just tell you that it's out there. This all, by the way, this reminds me so much of, um, uh, do, do you guys familiar with Bean Boozled? No. No. These are, uh, my kids keep giving them to me. These oh, are, no, I do know these. These are, these are jelly the, beans. These are the the every the birdies every flavored uh, beans, like from Harry Potter. They're like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like that. It's, so these are jelly beans, and you don't know whether you're getting jelly beans that taste like, you know, uh, uh, name something Cilantro. pleasant, something nice, and, and you know, <laughs> strawberry, or you're going to get Garlic. ones that taste like vomit or uh, vomit. Potenti- yeah, that's the oh, idea. There, there's this is what it's reminding me of. Butyric anyway. acid, yeah. <laughs> okay, so can we go back here for a second? I, I so I agree with you guys. This is this is fascinating, and this is uh, it's a nicely designed study. But you've got epi issues. I've got some minor issues, which is um, uh, it's uh, this is a small study. I mean, they had about True. fifty subjects per arm. Randomized, which is is nice. I, I appreciate that the 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 benefit of randomization is there. Though, if you actually look at their randomization groups, their baseline characteristics, there are differences between those groups, and they uh, make the claim that baseline characteristics were not significantly different between the groups, which is really missing the point. The point here is not whether or not they are significantly different. The point is, are they meaningfully different, such that I would think that these are not not equivalent groups to be testing one intervention versus the other. Right. Now they're not they're not none of them are such that I would say oh these are these are disturbingly different, but they're enough such that I would think you would want to do something about it and they they didn't. It's also of course 50 subjects per arm roughly. Um you know, I'm not going to necessarily uh uh bet everything on a study of 50 subjects. On the other hand, the 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 benefits are are pretty impressive and so I'm I'm certainly um, uh, 
you know, it's 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 very intriguing. I'd want to see a little bit more data, but it's certainly going in the right direction. Let me ask you one question, yeah. Matt. Um, they they did a formal power analysis, and they they determined that they had eighty percent power to detect a greater than minus 15% difference between the two groups if colonoscopy was 90% effective. Yep. And it turned out that the um, number of individuals in each arm that were actually analyzed per protocol were 53 in the capsule and 52 in the, co the colonoscopy group. Yep. What do you think about that in terms of their not having achieved their predetermined sample size? So they didn't hit the predetermined sample size, but they were within their predetermined non-inferiority margin. So we should say a non-inferiority trial is different from the typical what we refer to as a superiority trial, the typical study that we think of where we put, uh, I'd say, say, a new drug or, or a new treatment head-to-head -head with placebo, where we expect there's really not going to be much of uh, much going on, uh, and we expect our, our, our new drug or our new treatment should be better than placebo. Here's a case where you don't have a placebo comparison, and the reason you don't have a placebo comparison is there is already what's considered to be an effective means to transplant this stuff, and therefore you don't, you can, it's unethical, it would be unethical to compare to a placebo. So, uh, in a non-inferiority trial, we say, okay, all we're going to try to do is prove that this one is no worse than the, the treatment. And you have to specify in advance what you think of as no worse than. And in this case, they said minus 15% uh, on the limits of a, of a difference, I believe it was a difference, uh, yeah, a was. confidence interval for a, a risk difference, a difference between the two groups, which 15%, you know, to me is, is that's, that's Pretty quite, big. quite Pretty wide. wide. And yeah. that's why their, their sample size is so small. Um, I would love to have seen this done, you know, with with a, a risk difference of maybe seven percent or five percent or something like that. Um, that said, uh, as I say, I don't I don't dispute the results uh, so much as I just want to see this confirmed before I'd say you know it's definitely better. But the results are pretty impressive, and and uh, I, I didn't have any uh, major issues with it. Can Anyone? I? Can I? Uh, yeah, just to, to sort of touch up on that. I mean, the the the, the main concern touch about up. a a, a, a non inferiority trial would be that you you have a you know, you you achieve a result which satisfies your statistical definition of non inferiority. Yep. Right. Meaning that it falls within this thing, but but like say hypothetically that it was fourteen point nine nine percent less yeah. efficacious than the that the oral was fourteen point nine nine percent less efficacious than the colonoscopy. You would have satisfied the statistical definition of non-inferiority, but a rational person would look at it and say, well, actually, it's 15% worse. Well, well, hang on. That's only on the confidence limit. Right, right, the, right. The point estimate would have to be well below that. So difference of, say, 2%. With a confidence interval that goes that went up down, to went, went down to fifteen percent, fourteen point fourteen four point nine 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 percent. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. it begs the question: How did you? How did they come up with fifteen percent? That 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 they just pulled that number essentially out of. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it. it was sort of a that, survey of experts, which is typically how these things are done because there is no, there's no number you can you can right. you can look to. There's no rule. It's sort of what do we think clinically right. is meaningful. Right. And the, um, and the reason that they did an uh, an uh, inferiority study in this case was that. The, the advantages of taking pills are so much greater in terms right. of cost, in terms of side effects, some of yep. the things we said before, yep. that if you can show that they're essentially the same or one's not worse than the other, then... Uh, or not much worse, that, but much, right. much more practical. Right. Yep. Right. Right. Um, all right. I want to end with just by pointing out, as Don says, they did have some, uh, some surveys that went along with this. As Don says, they, they asked people whether they uh, found this... They let them choose uh, categories to represent uh, their feelings about fecal transplantation, which went from neutral, natural remedy, innovative treatment, disgusting, unpleasant, gross, uh, unsanitary, risky, or unsafe. And then they asked them for the- They had the, icky in there, didn't they? I didn't see icky. <laughs> no, no. And then for the group that uh, actually got the pills, they asked them, did you experience unpleasant taste or smell with the pills? Uh, and my sense is that that people didn't didn't really. <laughs> they probably they, shouldn't. Uh, they but they double put, capsuled them. They, that's right. Oh, okay. The double capsules. It was two. Like usually, you know, you put your patterns on, into a single gelatin capsule. But here, they actually used two capsules uh, that like nested like uh, Russian dolls. Uh, to I think basically leave the concern that they might rupture or they might break apart. Yeah, but forty pills. I know it's you a lot of pills. that is a them. lot of pills. You have to swallow them, and you got to wash it down with a <laughs> lot of fluid. And one of the people yeah, who you've was, had um, that sensation where you've got a, a capsule that's sort of stuck in your esophagus. <laughs> yes. I don't know if you, you know, yeah. Oh, I don't know if you noticed in the in the fine print of the of the flow diagram, but one of the the, the subjects in the capsule arm trans uh, crossed over into the colonoscopy arm because they they they. 
could not swallow 40 yeah. capsules. They got Oof. to eight and they said, I'm done. <laughs> Never again. Yeah, I'm done. Yeah, it's, fair a lot enough. Of pills. it's a lot of pills. All right. Well, um, I would like to commend us for that discussion. <laughs> that was moderately mature. Right. Well done. Right. All right. So let's move on to our, our second segment in which we're going uh, to take on a topic that we're sort of uh, dancing around the, the P-value issue and we're going to instead focus on confidence. The P-value issue. The p- oh, <laughs> sorry. no. Sorry. He, he sorry. went there. Sorry. He went there. Someone was going to have to and he boldly You, you knew it was going to be me. How, how, how confident are we in this? Oh, uh, <laughs> children, children. Okay, so I, as I've said before on this podcast, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of confidence intervals. I much prefer confidence intervals or p-values. These are the different ways that we use to represent the, the random error in a study. And I don't want to get into my, my dislike of p-values too much uh, other than uh, to say that I, I much prefer confidence intervals over p-values uh, because I think that they, they get at much more information than a p-value tells you. A confidence interval tells you about uh, precision of a study, you know, how precisely did we measure what we, we say we're going to measure. Um, and so to sort of get us thinking about this, I want to start by asking you, if you, if, if you two see a confidence interval in a paper, um, do you look at that confidence interval for how wide it is, or do you look to see whether or not it contains the null value, in which case you're just using it for Hypothesis testing, which I would argue is not the reason to be using confidence intervals. I, I have a Chris, sense that you're you leading to, the yeah, witness I have, here. I think you've already answered the question, Matthew. I absolutely am. Well, as a f-ing moron. Uh, <laughs> you disagree. Uh, no, I. Uh, I confess I probably do a little bit of both. Is that the right answer? <laughs> <laughs> Wrong answer. Wrong answer. Okay. No, Why? there's so much Why? more information conferred by a right. confidence oh, interval. Don drank the Kool-Aid. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I Why? mean, p-values p- do a dichotomous disservice, right? A dichotomous disservice. Say, say more about what you mean. So it, it artificially splits the world into two camps, true and not true. And so you got like p-value equals 0.06. And you're like, oh, darn, we were so intending to publish that. Versus P value equals 0.04, and we're like, we're in. Yeah, so I would, <laughs> you know, I here would, we go. I would be clear it's to true. I would be clear to separate out though. You're you're you are even there. You're conflating p values and hypothesis testing, which I, are two I, different I, things. I, you can have p values in which you ignore hypothesis testing altogether, and you just say we found a p value of 0.067, and therefore there is some some support for the null, but not as much as say if it was you know right. lower. Um, all of that, trying to take into account the, the bias that's in the study. But the question is, wh- why, why are you looking for the null value in your confidence interval? What, what does that tell you? Well, it, it is actually not telling us very much, it's is the not. truth. It really is not. No. Because it is, a, it is a continuous outcome, and, and it actually is illogical to dichotomize it. And we just do it by convention. But it's simply that, you know, the statistical field drew a line in the sand and says, here's true and here's not. And, uh, and, 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 and yet there is no, this, 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 nothing but air between those two distinctions. Yep. And it is, a, it is an unfortunate dichotomous disservice we've done to the, to the scientific community. And, yeah. and, and it's, it's, it's also, if, when you think about a, a p-value of 0.05, means that essentially five times out of a hundred chance would um, it indicate Be careful that. <laughs> no, but I, you know if you if you go fishing if you you know have have a data set and you look for associations uh, you know it, if you're if you're testing multiple times you're going to come up with stuff. Ra- stuff that randomly would 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 seem to indicate that you've got an effect when in fact you don't so i i, I would agree with that i'm not i'm not gonna i, I won't I won't critique the whole statement, but I will say um, we should probably back up a little bit to say that that for anyone who's who's not familiar with this, that that uh, we have to have some, or we typically want some way in studies to think about this idea of random error. You know, if you think about this in a in a sampling context, the idea that if I were to flip a coin ten times and it came up as heads eight times, we wouldn't think, oh, there's something weird of this coin. We would just think that sort of you know when you have a probability of fifty percent. Uh, and you only flip the coin 10 times, it might not come up exactly five times. And so we're trying to quantify- In fact, usually does not. How much things in, the, in this particular, how much things might be sort of just associated just through sort of processes of, of, of random, random error. Um, and I would argue though that, that, that I don't think that the, the point of the confidence interval is even, it even gets it, 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 it has to get at the point that you just made about uh, dichotomizing a-, a uh, what is effectively a continuous measure, the p-value, um, the 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 
for whatever reason, when hypothesis testing came along, we made this, this, this determination that we would set a limit at 5%. And if you were below 5%, then we could, could declare statistical significance. And we imparted meaning to that, 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 that somehow gives you a study. almost religious myth. That's myth. given your study result, meaning everyone is trying to get their results to, to below 0.05, which results in, in this, this concept of p-hacking, this idea that you just keep you know, adding one more variable to your, to your analysis until you get a significant result. But I, leave that all aside. I mean, I, I, I think the whole point of the, 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 the confidence interval is that it tells us about precision, a different concept from random error. It tells us, you know, have we measured what we said we measured uh, precisely or not? And I would, I would, to do this, I would say, you know, if we, have a, if we have a study that finds no effect of some exposure on some outcome, so let's say we just did this, this study here, and it was uh, we were comparing the the poop pill to placebo, and we found actually the the rates of cure were actually identical. Well, that's that's useful and meaningful information if we think we've measured it well. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. just important as important to know that two things are not related as to know that they are related and related causally in particular. So if I if I find that the the, the rate of cure between the the poop pill and the and the should stop using that example, and the placebo are identical, <laughs> but the confidence interval around that is really wide, then I'm yeah. saying, well, I don't actually know very much. Right, right. you, you can't don't really cheat. know that they are. You can't yeah. cheat by underpowering your study. Right, because I would find no significant difference, right. but no meaningful information. Whereas if I find no difference and a really narrow confidence interval, that says, well, we actually know for sure, or assuming there's no bias and, and we can reasonably <laughs> rule know, that out, that there is no effect. And that's important. Precision, I think, is what matters, not... Significant. So, so, so it's sort of analogous to looking through a pair of binoculars at an image and it's completely out of focus. You think, well, maybe there's two things there. I can't really tell. They're kind of blurring one with another. And then when you put the binoculars into focus, you can see very precisely whether there are, are in fact two different images that you're looking at. And that is sort of giving you greater precision to be able to distinguish these two objects that are in your field of view. And the, and the ability, the analogy. That was yeah. interesting. That? interesting analogy. And the ability okay. to focus is, 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 is driven by sample size here. Right. That focuses the tune. Yeah, binoculars. I, I want. I do also want to make the cav I want to just emphasize the caveat that all of this, whether we're talking about confidence intervals or p values, are judgments about statistical significance seem to be what drive findings that get published in much of the literature. Not all. There are definitely journals that that focus much more precision, but generally speaking, uh, a p value of less than 0.05 seems to be really important. It misses the point that p values are only only valid in the case where a study is measured uh, where the results have no bias whatsoever which is non-existent in the world that we for all the reasons we talked about and explain that Ex explain what you mean by that well so uh, much of the the theory around uh, the statistics center on the idea of randomization the idea that we've done the, the the randomized trial version of the study not the observational study if you do that at least we've minimized the probability of severe confounding you can still have of course misclassification and selection bias but but all of these statistics are based on the idea that I have the perfect study. And when we know we don't have the perfect study, trying to draw conclusions based on a p-value just below or just above 0.05, even if we wanted to, wouldn't have the meaning we'd wanted to. And therefore, I think this, this focus on p less than 0.05, and I didn't want to talk about this, but apparently you, you guys goaded me into it, is misguided. Mm -hmm. So there you go, folks. As promised right. from the last 10 episodes, <laughs> that, that is the Matt Fox P yeah, rant. The... No, Matt, I, 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 I do want to um, um, mention rant. one point. No, 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 not a P rant. But you, you were very specific in the terms you used. I was? You said over and over and over, Precision yeah. as opposed to accuracy. Precision, yes. And you're a smart guy, and I know that you did that. You, you're doing that on purpose. So could you just explain to, to the yeah. listeners what do you mean by precision versus yeah. accuracy? Yeah. So when I'm talking about precision, I'm talking about how wide is the confidence interval around the the, the point estimate, the difference or or relative effect that we're observing. So in this particular study, the the, the poop pill study, there was there was you know some difference between the groups. Say like a five percent. I actually don't remember what the number is. I don't know if you I think, guys. Do. I think it was zero percent. Was it, it really? Yeah, it was, yeah. it was right on the mark. No difference at all. Yeah. Okay. It was 0%. And then they calculated a confidence interval around that, which they only did a one-sided confidence interval because it was an inferiority study, which went to minus 6.1%. So let's say it's minus 6. Let's just say it was 6.1% on either side. That says to me, um, you've measured that, that null effect, that no difference between the groups, reasonably precisely. Because if you told me it was 6%, 
you know, six percent difference, but I can I can get a pill instead of a, a colonoscopy. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take that. I'd be okay with. I, I'd take that. So I would say that's reasonably precisely measured. Whereas if you told me the the point estimate was zero difference between the groups, zero percent difference, but the confidence interval went from minus fifty percent to positive fifty percent, yeah, then I'm going to say, well, actually, I don't really know what's going on. So precision to me is how wide is that confidence interval such that I feel like I know whether or not I've measured what I say I'm measuring well. Right, and that would be the equivalent of Don's taking the the the, the binoculars and throw them way out of focus by severely, deliberately underpowering your study and having a randomized trial of 10 and 10, where yep. the confidence intervals are going to be so wide you can drive a semi, uh, a semi tractor trailer truck through it. That's the one. That's the and one. That does not show non inferiority. It not. shows and lack of precision. And accuracy? And accuracy. I don't know is, what accuracy means. In this I think case. accuracy so and precision actually. There's a, there's a beautiful metaphor. Like imagine imagine a you target. have a, a target, right? Imagine <laughs> you have yeah, yeah. A, a a sniper rifle. Uh, centered on our target in in a, 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 a gymnasium so that there's no air movements, right? So you're there's you, no air movements. There's no in, well, wind. There's no that wind. That would explain the uh, okay? and, the and smell you, in most gymnasiums. And you <laughs> you you know you fire the gun enough times and so that you're gonna you hit a bull bullseye almost every single time and the the shots are going exactly around the bullseye, right? Yep. Now you tell the sniper to to leave the room and someone study volunteer comes in with a little bell pin hammer and, and slightly goes tap on the scope. And then the sniper comes back in. And now you take away the bullseye and you just have an empty piece of paper. And so the sniper then starts firing the gun and the bullets again, you know, hit a, hit a tight pattern on the paper. But, if, but what you don't know, you know, what you know is that the, the, the you know, the clustering of the bullets is precision, right? Yep. If they all come close together, that's yep. a very precise, yep. it's a very, you know, reliable rifle, okay? It's very reliable. But, but what you don't know is whether it's hitting the bullseye. And so if you then superimpose the paper on it where the bullet was, you can see, you might find that all the, the, the bullets are clustering in a very small region, but very far away from the bullseye. Yep. And that's bias. Okay. So, so that's you're, the you're, difference between accuracy and precision. I, I, would, I would not call that accuracy. I would call it validity. Okay. Validity well, versus precision. I would precision. say accuracy is like measuring the thing you think you're measuring. Okay. And we're, you know, here we don't know what we're measuring as soon as the, the problem in clinical medicine, clinical epidemiology is we don't actually have a bullseye frame of reference most of the time to tell us whether they're measuring the right thing. I would agree so with you So we're there. always somehow missing the target slightly and we don't know to what degree. All right. Anyone done? You want the last word on this one or are you good? No, I'm good. All right. So then, uh, well done, everybody. Let's, uh, let's move on and get to our last segment, our amazing and amusing segment, where we want to highlight some of the things that make us enjoy our jobs even more than we already do. We'll look at the weird and wacky things that happen in our field, as well as those that inspire us or take Chris onto tangents about bees. So, uh, Chris, do you want to you wanna go first this time? Yeah, sure. Um, I found a, a, a really good paper that... Uh, uh, actually hits our sweet spot because it's it's all about media bias. Oh yeah, and this is published in in the journal Plus One and it's called Exaggerations and Caveats in Press Releases and Health Related Science News. All right, by Petrock Sumner and colleagues from um, Cardiff University in the United Kingdom. Okay, and and so they they start with the you know the 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 observation as we often do that that uh, when you look at a a, a press a news story in the in the media, whether it be you know print uh, or uh, radio or TV, that the news reports are often uh, exaggerating the science, and so you'll see correlations presented as causalities. You'll see uh, you know a study done in mice that leads to health advice in people. You know you'll hear um, all sorts of, of sort of exaggerations, and also uh, a, a relative paucity of caveats, like saying you know we saw this thing in jellyfish, but I would not. <laughs> Assume that this applies to you, <laughs> right? Yeah. Jellyfish ain't babies, right? Jellyfish ain't babies, right? Even jelly That's babies. That's going to be the title of the this podcast thing. episode. <laughs> jellyfish ain't babies. So, so what they, but they, so while it is empirically clear that the 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 the, the, the lay press is rife with exaggerations and poor in caveats. Yep. The question that they were trying to answer is like, where wow. does that misinformation arise? And so the, the assumption has always been that it's, that it's the lay press that's to fault. 
and that like you know you know the scientists are giving them all the perfect pure information, information. perfect it's information, never our fault. and that the media is running amok. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, and what so wait, found... are you going to blame the the researchers? <laughs> can, can, can you edit this out? No, no. Can you edit this out? It's, it's not. We, we might have a little blame here. Uh-oh. Unfortunately, Uh-oh. we might. So what they did is that you have to sort of imagine it as like a, it's a multi step process. Like first of all, you got the paper, right, which is what the the scientists write and say. Uh, then comes a press release. And the press release is typically, you know, it would be like our media shop here. Um, media. Uh, Kara University Peterson's media. people, yep. University Media, who, 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 you know, write a little uh, press release. Yep. Or it could come from the funder or it could come from the journal. Like, you know, JAMA often or BMJ or Lancet often have their own internal media press that writes these things. And then the, the lay press typically bases their... Um, their story on the press release, yep. almost exclusively, in fact, on the press release. They don't read the article? They, um, I don't know if they don't, but I the press release seems to be the most important factor mm. because the, the media story, as it turns out, um, very, very much follow the press release. And where the error comes in is in the translation between the scientific paper and the press release. Mm. Um, and that actually, when you look at the the concordance between what the press release said and what the media said, they are pretty close on. So oh. when when the press release says, you know, big caveat, the media reports often say big caveat. They're they're not perfect on that. Um, where they're actually actually quite good is when the press release says correlation does not equal causation. Beware. The the media press uh, stories typically say that as well. Yep. And conversely, when the paper says, you know, correlation does not equal causation, and the press release does not, the media stories usually do, do not. not. And so the error is either because of communication between the the, 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 the researchers and the press apartment or the press uh, releases uh, themselves. But but I have to say that it is ultimately the responsibility of the researchers 100% to because vet the press releases, not the, not the not the fault of, of the yeah. media office. Yeah. And so we have to we on this one I'm afraid we have a lot of uh, of uh, soul searching and we need to look at ourselves in the mirror a little bit harder on this oh one. Oh boy. All right. Oi, oi. I was I was afraid I, know, I, know. I was afraid this was going to be bad news. Drats. So All right. jolly wacky, wicked wacky science there. Oh, All right. Geez. Shoot. Well, shoot. that wasn't uplifting. <laughs> All well, right, so see the next I am, one. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to go second this time. I'm going to let uh, the Don take the last one. So we have spent uh, a number of, of wacky uh, science, as Don calls it, amazing and amusing segments, talking about uh, some of the problems. Well, I suppose you just highlighted a little bit. Some of the problems with, um, with journals. In particular, we talked about predatory journals in the past. Uh, how, many, how many would you say uh, uh, emails you get, do you get a day from journals that you've never heard of Asking you to submit a paper or become a member of the editorial board. Minimum five, maximum 15, yeah. 20. And why is it, explain to me, this is an aside, but why is it that when I put them on the, when I hit the junk thing, they never end up in my junk folder? They they manage to penetrate my my spam detection. And they keep coming they, back. Oh, yeah. It's like, like boomerangs. They don't go away. <laughs> Yeah. They just they start a new email. I don't know what it is. So have you up. discovered the answer? No, I have not. No, oh. that's not about this. Um, what I did discover, and I, I, I did not know this, is that this has been uh, this is a, a, something that's been irked people for a long time. Both both the the all the proliferation of these these journals that are predatory, but also the uh, the the spam emails that you get from them. Uh, so and, and this is an, uh, came from an article in in Vox uh, in 2014, but it was. Uh, about uh, a couple of researchers back in 2005, two uh, computer scientists named David Mazeris and Eddie Kohler, who uh, published, who, sorry, published, who wrote a paper in response to uh, all of these emails they were getting from these journals, the title of which is Get Me Off Your Bleeping Mail List. <laughs> uh, the article, uh, uh, let me read you the abstract. The abstract says, Get Me Off Your Bleeping Mail List. Get me off your bleeping mail list. Get me off your bleeping <laughs> mail list. Keeps going. Uh, they wrote an entire article written with only that with one sentence. Only that one <laughs> sentence, including they made a, a flow chart <laughs> of the words. Get me off your bleeping mail list. They made a. Does it really uh, say bleeping, or are you just being? I am dis- trying to keep us from getting the the, the R dreaded the, explicit the naughty stamp. Rating. They made a uh, uh, a scatter plot. 
I'm looking, uh, at, I'm looking at the figure. It doesn't actually say bleeping. It's, it <laughs> no, uses no, a different no, word. No, it doesn't. It's a different word. <laughs> it's effing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. They made a scatter plot, which spells out. <laughs> Get me off your bleeping, bleeping mail list. Oh, that's brilliant. And so they sent it around to a bunch of people. And the story goes, and I don't know if this is true, but this is what Vox reports, that uh, they sent it to someone else. Uh, you know, sent it to a bunch of people. It was sort of making the rounds. And somebody submitted it oh, come to on. a journal. They submitted it to the uh, journal... The International <laughs> Journal of Advanced Computer Technology, and they got back an immediate response saying it was accepted. Please send $150 to publish. Oh, my oh God. My God. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, did but that fall, is the did story. Did they fall through on it and it got published? I don't think so because I went to the journal and tried to look it up and did not <laughs> find the article so there. So but it has been making the rounds on the internet ever since. That is so insane. There insane. You go. Wow. Good for All them. Right. All Don, right. what do you got? So I have a shout out to a um, clinical fellow in infectious diseases who is uh, who is from the same um, the same place that Chris and I did our infectious disease training, and this fellow Toys R Us. This fellow is this uh, John? No, this is Martin Kaminsky, oh. clinical fellow in infectious diseases, and this is an article that has appeared in this year's BMJ Christmas, Christmas edition. issue. All right. And so you know he, we love the he's, a, he's a U.S. citizen who went to England to get trained as a medical doctor. Got it. And he noticed that there was a difference in the lexicon phrases that are used for um, for the medical profession there and here. Oh, and so, so not just, we're not just talking about the difference between aluminum and aluminium. We're talking about different Correct. words. Correct. Or it. phrases. Or phrases. Or phrases. And so he created two tables of phrases that um, are used in the U.S. and what they mean in the U.K. Got it. So, for instance, um, the OR in the United States means the operating room. Um, and in the U.K., it's a conjunction that means either. <laughs> <laughs> um, and to elope for a patient in the United States means to leave the hospital without informing anyone. I didn't know that. Whereas in the UK, to secretly wed without telling one's family, <laughs> like Romeo and Juliet. I did not know that elope <laughs> was a term you all use in the, yeah. in the hospital. Yeah. Stat. Now, yeah. damn it, for the love of all that is holy, Carter. <laughs> something that I assume to have been said on ER. And yep. in the UK, something that is only written on drug charts and said aloud on US television programs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And that status post is a very technical sounding phrase, simply meaning which was treated with, such as Mrs. Jones has had a myocardial infarction, status post PCI. Which was treated with. And in the UK, it is an elite post. <laughs> <laughs> so to turn it around, those things that are said or um, are, uh, discussed in the UK would be theater. In the UK, yep. is short for operating theater, um, whereas in the United States, it's a place where patients go to catch a show, maybe Les Miserables. <laughs> That's where Romeo and Juliet happen. Right. Um, the junior doctor in the United States is a doctor in training that is below the grade of. I'm sorry. In the UK yep. is a is a doctor in training that is below the grade of a consultant. Whereas in the in the US it's a small doctor. <laughs> Self discharge in Ooh, the UK is when a pa know. when a patient leaves hospital against medical advice, and in the US it's an undesirable fluid flow yep, out of one's I, own spot. I had a feeling we were going there. And then my favorite is um, GMC in the UK GMC. means General Medical Council, yep. the National Medical Licensing. Board, whereas in the United States, it's a U.S. company that makes pickup trucks. Make <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Okay, so you have uh, made it to the end of our program. If you've got any feedback on this or any other episodes or you want to suggest a study or a topic for us to take on, you can tweet us at, at PopHealthyX or you can tweet me at, at ProfMadFox or Chris at, at ID.Gill or Don at, at DThea1. Or you can find us on the Population Health Exchange website. That's www.pophealthyx.org. We want to thank Leslie Talalian, Director of Lifelong Learning at BU School of Public Health, for supporting the podcast, and Nick Guler for sound and editing, of which there is apparently going to be quite a bit on this particular episode. So <laughs> no, thanks Nick, for working no, overtime, Nick. Thank you for joining us. We, uh, we hope you enjoyed it, and we hope you will download our next episode. <laughs>